No singing during the live, because you're on. Hey, everybody, how you doing? Sorry for the late start. We had just a tiny, tiny bit of a technical glitch there. But uh, I think that we are broadcasting now. I'm watching Katie over there, who's in the control booth, and she says it's all good. So um, this is cool. There are a bunch of questions on here already. And I just want to show you one cool thing, though, because I'm stupid excited about this. So I'm going to do a little bit of show and tell, and then I'm going to get to your questions right away. I made this thing for a friend of mine. Get my screen so I can see what you're looking at. Brrr. All right. That thing, it's called a lithophane or lithopane, depending on how you pronounce it. This material, what it's cut from, is this stuff. This is quarter inch thick solid surface countertop. So brand names of that would be Corian or Avonite. And it's important that it's white or ivory. It can't be patterned. This work was done on the CNC. The work is, I started with an eighth inch ball nose bit and I roughed it out. And then I finished it with a 16th inch ball nose bit. And the work I did here, the tool path on the CNC was created in software called Photo VCarve from Vectric. Now, the gee whiz moment is, you're looking at this thinking, what the heck is he talking about? Why is he so excited? That's stupid. Well, so okay, so look at this. And then let's give it a little light source. Get that in the right spot. I've got an LED behind it, if I get it in a good position. So it's like what I think used to be called a tintype. It ends up looking like a black and white photo. And the premise with this setup is it'll sit on a windowsill. And then when the sun is out behind it, it backlights it. But people will also do this and then build a shadow box and then put an LED light like this behind it in the shadow box. So the way it works is that where it's dark here, her jacket, that's an area where, too close, that's an area where the software left the material thick, so less light comes through. And where it's light, pants, face, that's an area where it's cut really, really thin. It's about 40 thousandths of an inch thick at its thinnest point. So 60 thousandths of an inch is about a 16th. So it's less than a 16th thick, just about like, not quite tissue paper thin, but close. And that the LED is giving you an okay representation here, but when this is just sitting correctly, like in the windowsill, it is incredible how much detail comes through with the trees and faces and the background. And um, it's a really amazing thing. Uh, the, the only real downside to it is it's about four hours machine time on that finishing pass. Um, that particular image, I think, was six inches wide and eight inches tall. So to get the 16th inch bit to do all that detail was like four hours, maybe even a little bit more. But of course, with the CNC, I can press the go button and do 2,000 2, other things while the CNC is running in the background. So it's pretty neat. We're going to do a video on that. Um, in the not too distant future to do the how-to behind it. Um, but I'm just, I'm stupid excited about it. My friend's gonna come pick it up tomorrow. I think that's his Valentine's Day gift for his wife. Um, so I can't, I can't wait for him to see it. Okie doke. Greg says, I have eight quarter rough saw and walnut. I plan to mill and glue up for a 48 inch round table. I plan to cut with a router and jig. Do I need to use a steel C channel under the table to help stabilize seasonal movement or will I be fine without it? So we got to do like definitions here. So seasonal movement, C channels, battens, braces, nothing. We can't stop, prevent, slow down, minimize seasonal movement. You want the wood to be stable. You're doing a pretty big tabletop here. So make sure the wood is stable, but um, the addition of anything is not gonna change the expansion and the contraction. 
what we want out of a tabletop that big. I'm assuming if it's a round top, um, are you putting it on like a pedestal type base from which it's going to cantilever? That's a bigger concern where you'd want some kind of support under that cantilever where the wood is projected out. If you're doing a round table and a traditional leg and apron brace under it, or I'm, I say that right, leg and apron assembly under it, then that would be all you need and you're going to be fine. So don't, um, don't ever fasten stuff to the bottom of a big glue up with the intention of slowing down, minimizing, or stopping its expansion and contraction from winter to summer, because nature's always going to win. And if you try to stop it, you'll end up cracking that big, beautiful piece of walnut. Mark says, is there an alternative for filling pocket holes other than wooden plugs? Um, typically, pocket holes are punched with a 3 8 bit. So a 3 8 dowel is a pretty natural fit there. Um, if you're not familiar with it. So I don't know, like, because you don't want to use a conventional wooden dowel or I don't, I don't know what the objection is. Um, but if you've not seen it already, Craig makes, I am coming back. Craig makes this device. This allows you to cut your own plugs. So if you have pocket holes in, I don't know, walnut, and you want to make sure you have walnut plugs, or you want to contrast with a maple plug, with this jig from Craig, you can cut plugs from anything you want. Um, alternatively, you know, I don't know. I mean, I guess wood dough or something. Um, I think the wooden plug would look a little better. Um, if you're doing pocket holes where they're more like router cut, so, for instance, uh, the Castle machine, um, companies make, that's usually done with a 3 8 router bit. Some companies make plugs that'll go into, that's more like a 3 8 groove, that'll go into that 3 8 groove to mask that. So, I think those are your best alternatives. But other than that, like wood dough or epoxy or something over the top would do it. Joshua says, I inherited a Laguna table saw and Laguna bandsaw. Uh, I don't know much about, I don't know much about how much either has been used. I've cleaned them up and set them up properly and have been making cuts in soft woods like pine without any problem. With both tools, when I work with harder wood like hickory, I get a lot of smoke and burning and I have to push the piece more than I expect. Is it reasonable to assume I need to get new blades or is that normal or something else? Yeah, no. Um, it's got to be, it's got to be blades. So, um, hickory, dickory doc, I know I have some in here. So let's give you, just as a perspective, I don't want to spend forever looking for hickory, but let's go this way and this way and this way. So the blade on my table saw right now is a 40 tooth alternate top bevel table saw blade. This is white oak. The dark you see in it, those are bark inclusions. Um, those are those little black spots. I got to raise my blade. Let me get hearing protection on. There we go. Uh, dust collector. So there's a good feed rate expectation. So yeah, it sounds to me, I mean, especially smoking, um, that definitely sounds like you need new blades. Um, Mike is saying, we used to have these at seven. Will four be the new normal? Uh, yep, we're we're running these now. Um, this is, I think, month three at four o'clock. Uh, somebody's asking about um, 
their subscription and stuff and that I don't know anything about that. Um, all I do is the woodworking side of things. I have nothing to do with the business side of things. So there is, Katie, do you know like, or can you get the customer service number and just put it in the chat roll and either phone number or email or both? And that'd be the easiest way for this. There's no name here. It just says guest for that person to sort it out is call or email customer service. Cause that's nothing I can do about. I don't have anything to do with that stuff. Um, Dennis says drum sander versus planer. Great question. So two very similar tools. Of course, in a planer, we've got a cutter head with knives. Drum sander is set up very similarly. It's got a head, but it's got sandpaper on it. So like anything, you know, there's good news and there's bad news. With a planer, we can make a very aggressive cut. If you've got, if you've got like a stationary planer with an induction type motor in it, so not a benchtop planer with a universal motor, but a, a floor planer, an industrial a stationary planer um, with an induction motor, you can probably, even in hardwoods, you can take off an eighth inch per pass. Um, on a drum sander, even with an aggressive paper like 36 grit, you're not going to be able to take off that volume of wood. So if you're starting your projects with roughs on stock, to get it to where we've turned four quarter to three quarter or 13 sixteenths, getting to that point is going to happen faster with a planer. Now, when I make an end grain cutting board, I would never send an end grain cutting board through a planer because there's a good chance it can catch and tear chunks out. I would happily send it through a sander. Um, similarly, you can't plane, um, you can't plane man-made materials, but if you needed to skin down a piece of man-made stuff, you know, like that Corian that I started the gig with here showing you, I, I could run that through my sander if I needed to clean it up or make it just a little bit thinner. Can't run it through my planer. So they both have their places. I'm happy to spend your money and tell you that you got to have both because um, they both, they do, they each do things. They've got a lot of overlap. They're thicknessing machines. But in the end, for me, I'm lucky enough that I do have both. And my material starts on the planer. It ends on the sander, typically at 150 grit. And that leaves me very little work to do with a random orbit sander to clean that stuff up when I'm getting ready for finishing. Um, so there are, like I said, there's a lot of things there. Another good um, sander advantage is if I'm gluing up cabinet doors, Copen style, you know, so a frame door and it'll fit through my sander, my first step after gluing is to send that whole door through the sander. And of course, if you picture that, we've got styles and rails. You could never do that on a planer because you would tear the heck out of the rails, but I can do it on a sander. So there's lots of, uh, and, and I'll give you another thing. On a sander, you can get really, really thin. So um, when I made the stems for my canoe, which we can look at if we have time, um, they're less than an eighth inch thick in order to do the bent lamination that the stems required. I finished those on the sander. Planer would never allow me to cut material that thin. Um, but again, the planer lets you be more aggressive. Um, it's less expensive generally to get a wide planer than a wide sander. Um, so it's just, you, you got to evaluate what it is you want to do with it and go from there. Uh, Brian says, I made a coffee table out of walnut, finished it with Danish oil and applied paste wax. How do I get the paste wax off? What dissolves paste wax? I don't, does it say, does it say on the can what the solvent for paste wax would be? I'm not sure. I kind of feel like, I kind of feel like mineral spirits would take the paste wax off, but I'm not 100% sure. I would try on a piece of scrap. I would do the same recipe and do a big enough board, you know, do, do Danish oil and paste wax on a big enough board and then try with, I'm assuming when you say paste wax, you're trying to get the wax off and not the oil. So um, try mineral spirits, see if that works. 
denatured alcohol, that might be a little stronger than you want to go because that might start to remove the oil. Um, but I think between the two of those, it, somewhere there's a solvent there. And it, and it might, Google might have the answer there. Um, the question being on for Google, what's the solvent for, and you could name your paste wax, if it's a Carnoba-based paste wax, what's the solvent for paste wax? Um, can you share the vectric settings for the lithograph? Uh, I can get close. Um, it's photo VCARV was the software. Um, import the picture, that part's easy. Roughing pass was an eighth inch ball nose. Um, that, um, you never exceed a, a I got to think of a second, 0.1 inch. You never exceed 0.1 inch for depth of cut. Um, and then the overlap can be greater. I mean, I'm sorry, the overlap can be less. Um, I believe I had that setting at 50%. There's a slider bar um, for the roughing pass. And then um, you save that tool path. And then you set up for the 16th inch. Um, all, both of these cuts are being made on a 45 degree bias across the artwork. Um, so you still use a tenth of an inch, or I'm sorry, 0.1 inch um, is, your, is your depth of cut setting. The difference with 16th inch, you turn that slider to 15%. So you really bring your passes much closer together. That's why you have way more machine time. Um, and then the difference is when you tool path it, when you cut it, you're going to Z0 the eighth inch bit to the surface. And you're going to Z0 the 16th inch bit when you're ready for that to the surface, but then drop it another 0.1 inch. In other words, you're manually bringing that zero down to the surface that was already cut by the roughing pass. Otherwise, the 16th bit won't do anything. And then from there, walk away and have a cup of coffee because it's going to take a while. Uh, watch the DVD about making knives and a knife block. Wondering where besides at the online South American River you buy your knife blanks. And hopefully you don't get the wind and weather we're getting in North Dakota. Yeah, this is from John. Um, Katie and I were just talking. It's, it's very gray outside. We're supposed to get snow today. And the cloud cover looks like it is 10 feet above my shop and very pregnant with snow. Um, I, I think overnight we're going to get snow. I don't know how much, but I, I walk a half mile back and forth to work. So I don't really care. Um, I do not have a, uh, I do not have a commute. I mean, I guess I have a commute, but not a commute I care about. Um, so anyway, to answer the question, um, knife blanks. Um, so Woodcraft Supply sells some really great knife blanks. I bought a bunch of Damascus steel kitchen knives from them. I just gave my kid one for Christmas. Um, and then Jantz, J-A-N-T-Z Supply is uh, another place. I bought a significant number of knife blanks from them. And there you can get them as cheap as five or six bucks. You can spend 150 bucks, um, just depending on what it is you're looking for. So it's nice with Jantz, they have a huge array of stuff available. So if you're just dipping your toe in the knife handle making marketplace, um, you can get a really inexpensive blank and just play around with it. Um, Rockler also sells knife blanks. I'm trying to think. I think they sell more like a hunting style knife. I'm not sure if they have a kitchen style knife, but it's definitely worth looking at um, Woodcraft and Rockler for the knife blanks. And then um, Jan Supply knifemaking.com is their website. Um, and I was going to point out, and Katie has put it in the comments here, we've put together a buyer's guide for um, some must-have tools for your shop. So when you look at on the, on the WWGOA landing page here, where we're doing the chat roll in the video, uh, there's a banner there that says, expensive but worth every penny tools. That's the buying guide. So it's a good thing to know about. Um, I think it was Seth Keller, one of our writers that put that thing together. Um, and it's a, it's a really handy little guide for some more um, specialized stuff for your shop. 
Uh, Harold from YouTube. I'm trying to artificially weather end grain on cedar planks. I want the wood to look bleached and leather and weather checked. Do you have any experience doing this? So you could try, let me see if I can, if I can find it quickly, I will, and bring it back. There is a product. Call. Try one more shelf. Ha. Oddly enough, there is a product called Weathered Wood Accelerator. Um, I have put this on oak. Um, I haven't tried it on cedar, but it's just what it sounds like. I mean, if you look at their little examples on the cover here, so in a natural color, and then with this stuff brushed on, see how it grays it? So if that would be, it's a Verithane product. Um, so that would be worth a look, <coughs> excuse me, to, to try to artificially weather it. Tim is building an outfeed table for a saw. <clears throat> Will be approximately four feet by eight feet. I intend to put 22 millimeter holes in the top using the PARF system. I don't know what that is for hole boring, yielding 22 millimeter holes spaced 96 millimeters apart. How large of an area would you recommend for these holes? So um, I have got, this is my main bench that I use most of the time. Um, so in this one, all I have done for holes is a bank of holes here and a bank of holes there. And then I have a variety, wrong drawer, of hold down devices that I can use with those holes. In addition to dogs, there's one right there, that I can use with the dog on my uh, vice. Uh, for me, that works, but in part it works because obviously I've also got the T-track in the middle. So the T-track affords me the ability to slide stuff in there and that'll act as a stop. Um, I can also slide stuff in there that acts as a hold down. So I guess, you know, if I translated, this is a four by eight, if I translated this with the T-track into an array of holes, um, you know, I guess you could do a similar thing. I am, um, I am a little bit in from the end. I'm 15 inches on center from the end, and then 24, 24, 24 on these. So you could do a bank of holes around the outside. Part of the deal with my bank of holes around the outside is there's a vise here that lets me dog pressure in that direction. There's a vise there that lets me put pressure in that direction. So I can put dogs in the holes and squeeze with a vise, long board, short board. Um, so if you have a similar setup, you could do the dog holes around the perimeter and then maybe a line of dog holes, a line of dog holes. Um, that being said, I know people are way bigger users of like the Festool, what is it, FMT or whatever that table is called. Um, they're way more avid users of it than I am. So there might be 11 billion applications for more holes that I'm just not even aware of because I don't have access to it. So it might be worth poking around online um, to see, you know, just to look at examples of how people are using their perforated tables, um, to see like, if you're, if you're never going to do X and X calls for a billion holes, then don't do a billion holes. Um, for the way I use stuff, this bench has served me very well with this setup.
Ken is building a keepsake box with flocking for the interior. Do I finish the outside completely and then do the flocking or do the flocking first and then apply finish? So read the destructions with the flocking. Um, the stuff that I've used anyway, um, the brand of which is currently escaping me, they want the surface finished before you put the flocking on. So if the same, if the same finish is going on everything, you could finish the entire project. And then what I generally do in that case is I put masking tape on the top edges of the box sides. So when I do the colored adhesive and the flocking, it's not washing up over that. Can do all that work, peel the tape off. If a little bit of colored adhesive is maybe bled under the tape, you could do a light sanding and then just apply finish in that spot to catch it up to where everything else is. Um, but the, at the end of the day, um, again, read the directions. If they, if your brand also wants the interior finished before the flocking goes on, then um, I guess I would just go ahead and finish the whole thing ahead of time. Because what, like, especially if you're doing a rattle can of aerosol or something, a rattle can of lacquer, um, to then go back and spray the box and not get that stuff on the flocking would be really, really hard. Mike says, what are different examples of when you'd use a table saw, a handheld router, or a router table to cut dados? So for me, um, in my idiosyncratic world, almost all of my dados are cut on a table saw. Um, and that's, I've done cabinets, I've done kitchens full of cabinets, um, onesie, twosie cabinets. So the exception to that rule would come in if I had to build like an armoire that was gonna be seven feet tall, I probably wouldn't be able to handle the sheet goods on my table saw to handle them, hold them down, be safe. Um, so on a big sheet like that, it'd probably be easier to take the uh, tool to the work instead of the work to the tool. Um, router table, I hardly, I don't know that I've ever cut a dado. Like I've cut grooves for drawer bottoms, which are grooves, not dados, you know, parallel to the grain, not across the grain. I've done that on a router table. I'm sitting here looking at my router table for inspiration. Um, but, but joinery dados, the problem with a router table is you're really, you're married into a bit diameter. And it's so unusual for anything to be perfectly fractionally matched to the diameter of a router bit. So on a table saw, I can use my stackable dado head and I can build it up or down to the exact size of my material. At the bench, handheld router, I've got a shot made jig that adjusts. So regardless of the stock size, I can make a dado that fits. H much harder to do on a router table, for me anyway. So um, it's really for me, it toggles table saw handheld router and table saw carries 98% of the load for um, dados, daddy -o. All right, Joshua was impressed with the uh, white oak cutting. So uh, yeah, blades are, new blades are good. So um, for whomever was asking, that was guest, no name, was asking about, um, prescription and, or sorry, subscription um, and that kind of stuff with membership. Um, Katie has put in the customer service contact info right there in the chat roll. Jay says, I recently did some bent lamination with mixed results. What glue or epoxy is the strongest for this application? I think just woodworking glue so that, um, what time is it? 22, before we're done here, I'm gonna, we'll go and have a look at the stems on the canoe that's sitting right there. I, I think I showed you the canoe a month ago, but I don't know that I had the stems on. Um, I did those with type on three for the glue. So you want a glue that's not gonna set up uber fast because um, that was quite a few layers. It was like 12 layers of wood to do that. And then of course you gotta have time to get it bent and clamped. Um, so yeah, I've always, the, the little bit of bent lamination I've done I've always just done with wood glue. John says, ever use Apatong wood? I have not. It's very hard to drill. And on my table saw, it gummed up my saw blade. 
any advice on using on using it? So you can put, there are cutting lubricants. Um, I don't have a brand off the top of my head, but if you Google for um, woodworking tool cutting lubricants, there are things that you can spritz onto um, router bits and table saw blades that will help seal them a little bit to help prevent stuff from sticking to them so readily. I don't know the frequency with which you have to do that because I don't work with a lot of gummy wood, so I don't do it. Um, but I know they're out there in the marketplace. For drilling, it's interesting, hard to drill. Um, I don't know, sharp it, go slow. And same thing, you know, so if it's gumming your table saw blade, maybe when you're drilling, it's gumming, it's sticking to the flutes a bit and it doesn't want to clear. So uh, the same spritzy stuff. And then um, I've run into some woods on the drill press where um, some cool, weird, exotic, oily thing that I want to turn a pen out of and turning a pen requires standing the blank on end and punching a seven millimeter or 10 millimeter hole in the end. Um, and if they're real oily, sometimes they don't want to clear. Um, so sometimes you just got to stop frequently, clear the flutes, go again, stop, clear the flutes. Uh, Joshua is planning on making a continuous grain keepsake jewelry box for my daughter. Would you recommend lock miter joints for the corners? Suggestions for such a product. Um, lock miter joints are great. And I like that when you look at the top of whatever you've made, you can see that cool interlocking joint. Now, if you're doing continuous grain, that means same material all four sides. So you'll see the joint, but it won't be as as um, I've done it a lot with cherry maple, walnut maple. So the joint itself really pops. Um, a lock miter joint is a, great, um, is a great joint. And like I said, it looks cool. It's uber strong. Um, there'd be, I'm trying to think on your continuous grain aspect. Do you, do you lose length? And I don't think you do. So, um, do you use like, do you lose length when you make the cut? And I don't think you do. So if you make your box sides and their exact length, exact length, exact length, which is grain, 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 um, then you should still be okay. I would, I would do a test cut with a lock miter just to do that fold and make sure you're still happy with the resulting grain. Otherwise, um, just a miter would be, you know, on something like a keepsake box, um, a miter with um, like Typon's quick and thick glue is really good for end grain gluing because it's thicker. Um, so that'd be a good glue choice for that. You could always reinforce it with splines if you felt you needed to. Larry says, what can be used to slow or prevent Paduk from fading? Yeah, I don't know. This is a struggle. Um, Paduke turning kind of ugly brownish purple heart going from a lovely, beautiful purple bubblegum color to, yeah, you know, um, box elder, those beautiful red stripes fading out over time. Um, I don't know um, if you did, in, in each of these cases, I don't know if the issue is, uh, if the chemistry is oxidation or UV or both. Um, so if you did a little research and found that people say this is caused by UV. So for instance, I think with cherry, it's darkened by sunlight, not by oxid oxidation. Um, then potentially a UV resistant clear coat would help prevent that. But it would take some research. I don't, I don't know the answer. Um, somebody out there in the world may have cracked that nut but I don't know for sure what it is. Brett says, I have a 30-year-old Powermatic 66. Came with a Beesmeyer fence. Laminated faces are peeling away from the Baltic birch substrate. Is replacing with UHMW. So if you're not familiar with that, ultra high molecular weight plastic. Better than plastic laminate or should I plan on going back with laminate? Is it practical to reuse the substrate or should I replace it? Um, the, the high molecular weight stuff is nice. It's very expensive. Um, 
a benefit would be you make one piece and fasten it, where with um, some kind of substrate with P-LAM on it, you're going you're gonna to make that whole thing up, including laminating, um, and then put that on. And I think what you want to do, it, generally, if you only laminate one side of something, it tends to go, it tends to warp. So you're going to want to laminate both sides. Um, so um, if, you're, if you're willing to pony up for the molecular weight stuff, you do a couple rips and a couple cross cuts and it's ready to put on. So that, that would work great. Um, whether you could use a substrate again or not is going to be a function of how cleanly the existing stuff comes off. Because, of course, we want that fence face to be dead flat. So if there are whoop-de-doos in there where you peel the laminate off and some of the Baltic came with it, you know, it chipped, or there are glue gobs left behind or chunks of P-LAM left behind, all that has to be flattened out before the new P-LAM goes on. For a piece of Baltic, you know, on my fence, it's a uh, half inch by three by 30. I wouldn't try to salvage it. I would just use a brand new piece. Can you recommend a good portable shop back system for a small garage? Yeah, I'm not much in the dust collection industry. Um, you know, the way to look at it is you want to look at what tools you're using. And then you can find for those tools the CFM that they require, cubic feet per minute. So a table saw has a number, a planer has a number, a band saw has a number, and then match your dust collector to that. If you're always working by yourself in the shop and a table saw is 400 CFM, if I have a dust collector that slightly exceeds that need, I'm going to be okay. If somebody's going to be working with you, meaning you're going to pick up two tools at one time, you need a bigger dust collector. As far as brands go, I'm just not versed enough in the industry um, to know what all's out there and, and make a viable recommendation. John says, is your nationality Slovak? My last name is very similar to yours without the V. Yep. Um, so urban legend in my family, um, my dad's family was Czech. And urban legend is that it was W, it was Wandriska up until a when it got changed to a V, um, I think around World War One, to make it more Germanic sounding and less Czech sound. Brad says, uh, signed up a month ago looking for tips on sharpening gouges, like lathe tools. Um, we've got a lot of stuff. So um, in always on WWGOA, when you're looking for stuff, when you're looking for info, the, the uh, rifle approach to finding stuff is this spot in the upper right-hand corner. And if you type in there, you know, it's like using Google. Start with a broad concept, sharpening. And if that's too much information, sharpening bench chisels, sharpening lathe chisels, sharpening gouges, sharpening George's wit. Um, and that's, that will lead you to then the landing page where that stuff is all sorted up. John says, the sheen on two coats of Osmo satin finish is very dull. This is the recommended amount. Anytime, any um, blah, 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 blah. recommendation on how to bring up the sheen. Um, bring up the sheen. I don't know, because I don't, I've used Osmo. Um, I'm trying to think if anything is here. Yeah. So this, where are we? The charcuterie board has Osmo on it. And I, a couple of coats. Um, this is soft maple. Um, and I'm, yeah, I don't know. You can see there, it's got a little pizzazz to it. 
So um, I'm happy with that. And I would say if you're, if you're not digging what you've got, I would contact their customer service. I don't want to, I don't want to lead you in a direction where um, some finishes can be buffed and polished and maybe some can't. Um, so I don't want to take you in a direction where I do more harm than good. So that's a case where um, you're going to be better off if you, if you hear it from the horse's mouth, the horse being Osmo. Uh, uh, what type of seal coat would you suggest for MDF jigs? I'm thinking shellac, amber shellac. Yeah, it'd be great. Easy to apply, dries fast, be a great choice. Um, moving fast, I'm trying to make sure we get them all. Um, Want to make a graduated cutting board, 36 by 18. How do I figure out the width of each strip? I would draw it. Um, to see what looks good to you. Um, I've done this once or twice. I don't think I have one here. Um, so a graduated cutting board would be like walnut and maple, and you have uh, a walnut strip an inch wide, three quarters of an inch wide, half inch wide. That's the, Those are too far apart. You'd want them closer in dimension. Um, where did I end? Half inch, quarter inch. And then starting with the maple, you do the same thing. So then when you glue them together, I think the one I did was a wide and a wide, and then they they diminish as they go toward the center. Um, so the skinny walnut piece is out here between the two widest maple pieces. That's how you put it together. Um, but yeah, I would, it, you know, SketchUp is a wonderful tool, and if you're not using it, then even just on a piece of rosin paper or scrap paper in your shop, draw out 36 by 18, which is, that's a really big cutting board. Um, draw out 36 by 18 and then draw a bunch of lines and keep going until you get the look that you want. And you don't, I would say, you don't have to draw lines 36 inches long. I, the, the critical thing is going to be the 18. So if you did an 18 inch wide block, two inches high, and then did some test layout and then another test layout and another, that'll get you there. Uh, if you have a good table saw and a circular saw with a homemade edge guide, is it still beneficial to get a track saw? Um, maybe. Um, I do, I've, I've got a track saw that I use and I'll use it even, even over my circ saw, I'll use it to buck plywood down because the cut quality is so darn good that from the track saw, I can go to the table saw and keep that track saw edge, where with a circ saw, even with a homemade track, that cut doesn't give me that good a quality. So when I get to the table saw, I'm gonna do two cuts, one of which is eliminating that circ saw edge. So this, this just an it depends. It's not a right or wrong. If, uh, if you wanna put it on your wish list and somebody gets you a track saw, you're gonna like having it um, and like using it, um, but it's not, if you've got a guide that's functional with your circ saw, it's not going to be hugely critical. James says, if you tried using CNC to cut mitered small box sides and did it work out? No, and this is this is high on my list, um, and I just haven't gotten to it yet. In fact, I bought, specifically, I bought a 90-degree um, V-bit so that I could try producing miters on the CNC to see what that would give me. And even more specifically, a CNC gig that you can do is folding miters. So um, dig, if you will, a picture, Prince said. If I have a board, if I have a single board and I come through it with a 90 degree V bit and I make this cut and this cut and this cut and I all but penetrate the face, the theory is, I can fold that up on the miter and then out here on the outside, the grain is still intact going around. Now, I have zero idea, don't ask me, do you leave 20,000 spine, 10,000 spine? Um, do my CNCs have the tolerance to do that? Do you wet it before you fold it? I have no idea. 
um, but it's a really cool idea. So um, I know in industry it's done. It, it gets done, but a little bit more with man-made materials, I think, than with solids. So the short answer to the question is I haven't tried it, but it's on my list. What would be a good go-to finish on a cedar bench for indoor use? Um, probably there's not little up. No one good answer to that. It depends on a lot of finishing depends on your setup and what you can apply. Um, stuff in the furniture oil categories like Danish oil, tongue oil, uh, boiled linseed oil. They're so easy to apply. You don't have to worry about dusty environments um, because you can always just wipe them. Um, so you don't have to worry about dust settling in it. They're not hugely durable. Um, where something like the varnishes, polyurethanes, lacquers, give you a little bit more durable finish. They've got more smell. Varnishes and polyurethanes have a longer cure time. So you're more prone to junk settling into your finish if that's part of your environment is, you know, your shop is also your finishing room. Um, where lacquers flash really fast, they dry really fast don't necessarily offer the protection of something like a polyurethane. Plus there's like 11 billion more products out there. So um, I would do take some cedar and some, a variety of finishing products and apply it and see what's giving you the look that you want, especially on an indoor project. You're not worried about it weathering outside. Uh, Ken asked about gold live on a regular schedule. And yeah, I don't know. I haven't been told anything about that. And again, I'm not in on the, um, on the setup side of everything. So I, you know, I get a memo from somebody that says we need to do a live on this date. And I do a live on that date. Um, I get an email. Um, so I get, that would be, Ken, that would be a good customer service question, not a George question. And Katie, um, a little bit, a little further up in the chat role, had to put the customer service contact info info. So shoot them a uh, shoot them an email. Uh, after a decent block plane, what's the next hand plane to buy? Yeah, I am such a bad guy to ask hand tool questions. I uh, my standing joke is there's a cabinet in my shop with a glass door, and all my tools are in it. My hand tools are in it, and the label on the door says "In case of emergency, break glass." Um, so I've, I've got a Lee Nielsen block plane I use all the time, but I'm not a guy who is grabbing a plane and leveling a face or shooting end grain or anything like that. So um, I don't know is my answer to that. Best glue to attach a quart top for a wood leg bench. Quart top. Uh, John, if you're still on, I don't know what that means. To attach a quart top for a wood leg bench. Yeah, I, I need a little more something on that. Best inexpensive material for a small to medium sized hand tool bench. Southern yellow pine, not widely available in my area. Um, well, MDF makes great workbench tops because it's heavy as heck. It's dense, wears well, not real attractive. Um, but commonly available at home centers. So for bench tops, that would be good. Um, for bases, you know, and, and also for the top, if you want to stay with solid, um, beach, maple, those are commonly used. Um, and then for the bases, um, construction grade lumber can work if you bring it in your shop and you give it time to season. Um, it's got to, you got to make sure it's completely dry before you mess with it, which generally involves getting it in your shop for a while. Um, but that can work. Tom says, I'm brand new to all of this and my head just exploded. I'm so sorry, Tom. Was it messy? Is someone available to help you clean up? I'm learning lots from you all. That's cool. Good. Ronald says, I'm, I'm watching the clock because I want to roll over to the stems on the canoe before we get out of here. Um, any real options available for a 20 year old craftsman table saw to add a true riving knife? I've tried the little tab type, 
but I'm not impressed with them. Any ideas? Yeah, I don't know anybody that's making aftermarket riving knives to retrofit to other brands of saws. I, I, there's nothing that I've seen. Steven says, no video and no answers. I don't know what that means. Did I just make you laugh? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I can quick do a double check. I'm on the, I mean, Katie, Katie would be telling me, I'm pointing to the laptop where I can see Katie. Katie would be telling me if we weren't actually broadcasting. So I think we're okay. Yeah, I, I see a video and I think I'm providing some answers. I don't know. Now I lost my place. There we go. What is hide glue used for? Luthiers use it for gluing in necks. Oh, <coughs> excuse me. That came out of nowhere. <coughs> it's almost like I'm in a dusty environment. Okay. Luthiers use it for gluing in necks, but does it have an advantage over regular wood glue? So yeah, hide glue is one of its big deals. It's a, is it's reversible. So if you apply heat and steam to something that's been put together with hide glue, you can pretty easily disassemble it. So the other place it gets used is on veneered projects. And the premise is um, you make a table, you veneer the top. Over time, if that veneer gets damaged, you can replace the veneer easily by letting the, getting the hide glue to let go without having to redo the entire table. So it's another place it gets used. I'm in the process of refinishing an old radio cabinet that has a lot of dirt in it. What should I use to clean up the dirt? And then what grit sandpaper to start with? Made in the 20s. Boy, I am just not, I'm not a refinishing person. So I really hate to provide an answer on this because I, I would hate to say, hey, use soap and water, use TSP, trisodium phosphate, use, I don't know, whatever. And then it completely destroys the, finish that's on there, the wood that's underneath the finish that, you know, it, it does something badly. Um, so my guess is somewhere out there in the interwebs, there's a site that does refinishing stuff like we do woodworking stuff. Um, and that would be a great place, a better place to ask that question. Cause I just, the finishing related stuff always scares me cause I don't want to lead somebody down the wrong path. Um, Tim says, in the future, I'll be building a miter station that will have base cabinets. What are your thoughts on having an extension fence versus no fence or having a miter slot, miter slot for measuring and block? I've heard if a piece is bowed, a vertical fence is not good. Yeah, so this was, this was a big thing. Uh, Wood Whisperer, Mark Spagnolo, um, Maybe it was going back and forth with Cremona, with Matt Cremona. Um, some, Matt, Mark was talking to somebody, and it was the kind of this philosophical thing of fence, no fence on a miter saw. And I get it. Um, so in my case, I have this. If I move the two bys, I've got, sorry. I've got four feet of Craig fence to the left of my saw. This all happened, this setup all happened before um, I saw Spagnolo's thing. It makes sense to me that, especially when I'm, when I'm, when I've got pieces a little more, when a little further along, primarily I've jointed an edge, having the fence is fine because I've got one straight edge. But I'm also coming to the saw and I'm rough cutting stock to get it ready to take to the planer, the joiner, whatever. Um, so in that stage, if you've got a banana, having a fence can be a problem. So what I like about this is I've got the Craig stop on here and I can slide that. There's a cursor, just like on a table saw. I can direct read the measurement, set it up and I'm good to go. So I do like that when I'm cutting multiples and I, I've given this a little bit of thought, not a ton. I don't know how Mark solved the problem of I want to cut to a finite length. I don't, I don't know what he's built into his table that allows him to create a stop system. And if you go to Mark's page, I'm, there's probably a video on it so that you could see 
what his solution for that was. So at this stage of the game, I'm, I'm happy with what I have there. And I'm not like, you know, oh my gosh, Mark is brilliant. I'm ready to tear that fence off. But someday when I have time, I would explore that a little bit and look at the option of um, that same setup minus the fence and, and how do I get a stop. Okay, I'm gonna pull one more off of here and then show you the canoe quick. Oh, John says a quartz top for an outdoor bench. So 100% um, silicone caulk is an amazing adhesive, amazing adhesive. Um, so I would say that's a good solution. Um, another thing you could do is call um, like kitchen countertop granite shops and ask them what they use to fasten it to countertops. But uh, I, I can give you a good example. A friend of mine is really into archery and wanted to turn the um, antenna on her truck into what looks like a little arrow. So she bought plastic fletching and then use silicon glue or silicon caulk, 100% silicone caulk, to fasten the fletching onto the antenna. And it, it looks just like an arrow going into the cab of the truck. It's very cool. Um, and that's, you know, driving 80 miles an hour on the freeway and everything, it's still stuck on there. So silicone is pretty amazing. But um, a good plan would be ask, ask a shop that does that for their day job. All right, let me quickly show you the caulk, or caulk, I'm hung up on that now. Show you the canoe, which does that have any caulk in it? Um, I'm gonna leave this and spin the canoe. Um, and then I'm gonna mention again, we've put together that um, buyer's guide about um, expensive must have tools. Um, and because they're expensive, it's nice to see the buyer's guide and what it is that they bring to the shop with uh, you know, why, why we think you should have them. So um, you can get that uh, just by clicking right above the chat roll and, and that'll give you access to that. All right, so I think, I'm, I'm sure I didn't have, if the stems were on, they weren't shaped. So again, where this thing started was, um, all the cedar out here looked like interlaced fingers, kind of like that. And um, I cut all that off. And let me just get you in there where you can see more better. I took a jigsaw, handheld jigsaw, and I completely cut the end of the canoe off, the cedar. Then I sanded that to fare the curve to get it to be a flowing curve. Then I made a form. So I basically traced that shape onto plywood and I cut this out. The stem itself is strips of walnut and maple. And as I mentioned earlier, each of those is just under an eighth inch thick in order to be able to make the bend that was required to do this. Then type on three, there's glue in between every layer and I put it on here and the holes are in here so that you can clamp the lamination and get it to make the bend. So then what's cool about this is this, this whole stem was this thick all the way around. But then here to ferret into this shape, this all got sanded off. So I knew the reason I alternated walnut and maypole was I knew that when I did that sanding, it would result in this. And I love that. Um, so that's, that's where those stems are at. So it's identical on each end. Um, and this baby is like at one more hour of sanding away from being ready for total boat epoxy, which will be very, very cool when this gets, um, I can't wait to see it wet with epoxy. It's going to be really beautiful. All right, folks. Um, going to let you go, get out of here. And thanks for tuning in for the live. Thanks to Tight Bond for sponsoring this. Um, interestingly, it's all Tight Bond 3 in between every cedar strip on here too, in addition to the stems. Um, so anyway, thanks again to Tight Bond for underwriting this. Click on that download link so you can have a look at that buyer's guide. 
and I will see you in a month, see you in February.